last time on 1 John chapter 3. John is reassuring, protecting, alerting, and teaching us. He wants us to know Jesus. There's some moral, social, and doctrinal tests. He gives strong warnings against temptation and false teachings, the anti-Jesus teachings. Last week, we covered that adoptions were available. We need to renew our hope in eternity. And if, we have, if there's lawless sin issues, then we need to let Jesus handle those once and for all in our lives. We shouldn't be led astray. And there should be some consistency of doing what is right, especially within the church amongst believers. And so now this is the same uh, chapter. We, we stopped, and he's continuing this. And I'm not even going to get full the, through the full chapter here because there's so much here. So he's going to give us another evidence of a true believer, and it's connected to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know those? All right. Now, if you didn't hear that, that was done really fast, like that guy that used to be in the commercials and ramble everything really fast, or they actually at the, they do at the bottom of every uh, medical commercial and tell you all the side effects in two seconds. Anyway, we'll cover those a little bit later, but this is one that you know. So this is continued. Right, the next verse, he says, For this is the message... You heard from the beginning, we should love one another. And what's really cool is actually, and this was not timed or figured out, but we covered this exact verse that he's referring to, that he refers to in John, talking about Jesus this Wednesday night. And it says this, Jesus says this, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. He's talking to the disciples. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love, if you love one another. So again, this is a recurring theme, really in lots of books of the Bible. So it's probably the first time you heard this in the family room, right? That's intentional that we talk about these things. But how we function in here with each other is one of the greatest signs that people will know that we're following Jesus. And we're like, oh. Hmm, well, who? Oh, ah, hmm. You know, and again, trust me, you can find people, and maybe you have been one of them, and, and we can all find reasons where we've been hurt by church, hurt by Christians, disappointed, expectations were here, and then we're here, and we were let down. We said, they were supposed to be Christians. They said they went to church. And so sometimes we're better at faking it until we make it. Come on, how many people are raised in church sometimes, and, and you knew all what to do in church, and I'm not making fun, but we knew when to and do all this stuff, but we could do it mindlessly and not even thinking about it. Maybe a little bit more modernly, this is how we might fake it. and then we'll get going. No. Okay. Hey, what? you just lay out their clothes because it takes me five minutes. Honey, That's perfect. seriously. Jack, well, we're already late for church. Hey, Go get yourself dressed. Did you pick up my stuff from the dry cleaners? Uh, ooh. Yes, but you gotta make it by yourself. Back. Okay. This is all I could find, and the zipper's broken. All right, I'll go grab a safety pin. I have the high score! <sighs> hey, 
Anna, what are you doing? Daddy, I'm painting your fingernails. Well, that's great, sweetie, but go get dressed. Still, okay, honey. Come on, let's go. Okay, everybody needs to eat. Here you go. I need one. Here you go. Okay, here you go. I forgot my shoes. Oh. Honey, we gotta go no. back. Nobody's taking off their shoes. And I want everybody to understand that we're working on <gasps> what? We made it. Yep. How do people can relate? All right? Now that's lighter, hopefully. But the goal is, right, we're not, we're not really supposed to come here and, 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 and fake like everything's perfect all the time, right? And, and, and we should work things out as a church sometimes with each other, and, and that's why there's growing together, and, and that's why we oh, here at True Light, especially, we don't want you just to show up at Sunday and you know, check the time card and all right, as soon as Pastor Keith says amen, please say amen. See, please say amen quicker. Uh, have a short song at the end of the, the sermon so we can get out of here. And I don't want to talk to anybody, right? But when you start to build relationships, it starts to build accountability and you grow in these areas. And then he goes right into a warning. It's a messy and dirty job to be the church. So he says this, do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. So Cain is this prototype of evil, or in this case, an absence of love. Here, jealousy led to hatred, which led to murder. So oftentimes the Bible does this. It shows us people and it says what not to do. And this is one of those examples. It's going to be a complete contrast to Jesus in a little bit. But I want to dig into this a little bit more. Let's look back at Genesis chapter 4 where we see Cain and Abel. He says this to Cain. God does in, in Genesis 4, 6 and 7. It says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So what's the warning here? Cain was given a warning, and he didn't listen. Right? Everyone know the story of Cain and Abel? If not, I have a children's Bible available. Why is that in a children's Bible? I don't know. That's a rough one to start with. <laughs> but we're given the warning, and we should listen. When we start to feel that temptation, right? And, it, and it, notice it starts an internal thing, right? Jealousy. It's not something you can see from the outside, necessarily. And we start to feel that comparison trap. You know that happens even with pastors sometimes? You start looking at other people's church online, and they show their service, and they show them feeding the hungry, and doing this big event, and making sure they take it from the camera angle that looks like there's 500 people, but there was five. I'm not picking on everyone, because I, I know that's not always the case. But we could start to look at them, oh, and start to be like, oh, well, yeah, well, of course, you know, they got this, they got that and start to be discontent with where God has us, with what God's doing in our life. Here's what the Bible's addressing, right? The heart of the issue. Let's jump to Jesus talking about this. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus always gets to the core of the issue. He says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, which Cain did, right? And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka. Anybody say that recently to anybody? You're good then, right? And is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger 
of the fire of hell. All right, who's called someone a fool or worse? The rest of you are lying. <laughs> we've said it. If we've mumbled it under our breath, we've thought it in our mind, we were driving on the north road. Come on. That tractor pulls out and you're like, oh, come on. The ferry traffic is suddenly the exact moment you need to pull out, and there are 9,000 cars coming from Orient. No one? And you're just like, yes, Lord, thank you for this moment of peace. Thank you for this delay. I praise you for the delay. There must be a bigger reason. We don't think of that in the moment, and that's little stuff. All right? Why is Jesus being so strict here? Well, let's look at a quote from a a powerful teacher. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. I just want you to see that, that Master Yoda stole this from Jesus. Okay? <laughs> see, Frank, I told you I was going to add Star Wars in, and he thought it was going to be because of him. Why, why, why is this important? Because Jesus is talking that jealousy leads to hatred, and hatred can lead to murder. Something internally starts to dwell and flow in us, and it's not motivated by love, and therefore gets way off target. And he goes on to say in 1 John chapter 3, Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Wow, that's a strong thing to say. We don't explain this enough in the church. When you admit you're a sinner and that you need Jesus to forgive you, he forgives you. He makes you new. He adopts you into the family. But here's the warning that goes alongside of that. This family isn't always seen positively outside of the church world walls. And when you begin to speak and live God's truth, people will reject you, but ultimately they're rejecting God. And they start to see that in you. And sometimes you don't even need to do anything. You don't even need to like, I didn't even really say much. I just started living differently. Hey, you know what? I'm not into that anymore. Thanks, but, I, I, you know, that, that's not me anymore. And people are like, oh, 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 you're, you're too good for us now. You, you, uh, no one? You're a holy roller. Peter addresses this exact topic of what can happen. And ultimately, it's what should happen. And this is where a lot of churches don't talk about this, right? Because we just preach peace and love and happiness, and God wants to bless you. And I believe that's true, but there's also a side that goes along with this that will test you, that will be difficult. And John's giving the warning. Peter's going to give the warning the same way. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And you know one of the reasons we, we celebrate Good Friday is because it's important that we sometimes get in to understand what Jesus really went through for us. And it's a little bit more of a somber service. It's a little bit more of a, of a bringing yourself to a place where you're like, whoa, this is difficult to comprehend and understand, and, and, I, and I need to understand that. And often in the, Bibles, it, in the Bible, it says over and over again that we are going to potentially suffer just like Jesus. And we're like, wait, wait, hold on. I thought, you know, we're forgiven and we're, and we're free and life's supposed to be, you know, roses from now on. The, the Bible actually doesn't teach that. We're going to get somewhere, amen, where, where it's free of, of all of the negative, bad, awful stuff. And that's eternity. That's heaven. But in the meantime... It doesn't always mean it's going to be easy, but it will be worth it if we stick with Jesus. Look what it goes on to say. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of, glor of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it's time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So if, you've, if you're going to suffer because you committed a crime, well, that's kind of on you. 
you broke the rules, you broke the law. But if you actually suffer for being an example of Jesus, praise the Lord. Well, wait, wait, did we sign up for that? You know, you imagine that, all right? Your sins are forgiven, but as soon as you walk out that door, you get ready. Sometimes, right, that's the thing that, that knocks us off course. We're like, wait, this, this is tougher than I thought. This is harder than I thought. I'm getting a little pushback from my family. They're, they're saying, oh, don't, don't push that Bible stuff on me. Don't talk about Jesus. Uh, don't, don't. And you're like, wait, oh, wait, hold on. People at work now are treating me funny. My friends are acting different around me. They're not inviting me. It's real, and I'm not just talking to teenagers. Hello? Right? Peter is reminding us, like, just realize that this stuff can happen. But if it does, because you are being a Christian, right? And, and again, speaking the truth in love, this is the premise of what John is talking about, then so be it. It's not usually what we hear. So John goes back to the proof of love, which is in the church. 1 John 3, 13 and 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Wow, right? That's bold. Like Jesus saying, like, if you're not loving each other in the church as Christians, then, then you might not be part of this. And you haven't, it hasn't clicked yet. And here's what this word hate means. It says you hate Right? And this is really important. This is why we define words when we're, when we're preaching. Because we hear that word hate, and that's a strong word, right? Oh, hate. Hate. And yet some of you hate vegetables that you should love. All right? But here's the difference with this word, okay? This is where translation, sometimes we have to define a word. Hate means this. To detest on a comparative basis. Or love less. Or esteem less. So understand that, right? I hate that in comparison to loving that. I love it less. And that's what we get mixed up. Because we're like, wait, he just said to hate. Hate shouldn't be the quality that defines a church. Remember, it says anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. Anyone who loves less a brother or sister is a murderer. This shouldn't be what defines the church, internally or externally. Here's another verse that maybe you've heard. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And we read this and we go, <gasps> what? Now, this is the same verb, to love less. So if anyone comes to me and does not love less, right, to love Jesus more than my family, then they can't follow after me. It's just putting things in the proper order. And not just saying it, right? It's good to say that, oh, God first, then family you know, right? It's one thing to say that and then do that. And that doesn't mean it's going to be competitive. Like, oh, nope, sorry. Can't talk to my family today. Got to talk to Jesus. <laughs> no, it, it's going to find that it's interconnected. But if you're putting your family's priorities over God's priorities in your life, you're going to find it all mixed up. Because God's priorities will actually end up putting your family at the, at the right priority, and then you'll be caring for your family the way God wants you to. Amen? That's not easy. But that's the way it's supposed to go. So this is that love less meaning. But let's take a look at hate that actually means hate. Romans 12, 9 and 10. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And here's what this word hate means. It means hate, to detest, to abhor. No comparative, just I don't like evil. Sorry, that's not mean to say, I hate evil. <laughs> is that wrong to say? I don't think so. Now, again, remember, we have to separate when someone is doing evil. I don't hate them, but I hate what they're doing. Man, that, that's terrible. That, that's destructive for their own life and maybe for other people around them. And so John is explaining this love-hate relationship, right, and what this is supposed to look like. So we're not supposed to be like Cain. We're supposed to be like Jesus. And this is where, again, we've talked about this not too long ago. We can't define love the same way, right? We can define if we see that word hate and go, whoa, I'm supposed to hate this? Like, no, 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 properly love less. And then 1 John 3.16, isn't it interesting that it's John 3.16 once again? I didn't make that up. 
But it says this, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So don't try to put love into your category. If love doesn't look like this, that's what love is. That's how we know what love is. If it doesn't look like Jesus, then maybe it's not that loving. Ooh, it got really quiet in here, right? And that, that's, a, that's a check for us, like, oh, I, I say that I love this or love the person, but this word love is the word agape. Maybe you've heard that, because remember, that word love in the Bible has different meanings depending on how it's, how it's used, but we just throw love. Oh, love. I love, 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 love. Come on. Where's my Instagram people? Every day you're loving, love, 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 heart, 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 right? And you feel good about yourself. You're like, oh, I got a hundred hearts today. I feel the love. That's not the same love, okay? This is where love means benevolence, goodwill, or esteem. And I love this part. Actively doing what the Lord prefers. Wow, that, that's real love. Like, I'm doing what the Lord prefers in church, and out of, out of church, public and private, and I'd be the first to raise my hand. I got some work to do. I got some work to do. That, that love doesn't always automatically come out like, da -da. oh, you're a pastor, so that should. No, sometimes it's a struggle. And I need to, like, no, Lord, I need to understand your love more. We see what hate leads to. Now let's see what self sacrificing love leads to. Here's two verses. Jesus is talking here. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We most likely won't have an opportunity to, to example this verse in one of those action hero ways, right? We push someone out of the way just as the train was coming, right? That sounds exciting, but then probably not going to have an opportunity to do that. If you do, go ahead. That's awesome, right? And, and then we see this and go, oh, okay, well, I'm not Jesus. I'm not going to do that. So what are some everyday living things? John's going to go right into some everyday living things that we can do. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Okay, so... Um, well, where are we supposed to go with this? You know, this starts, this starts here as a church. So uh, well, well, how far are we supposed to take this, Pastor Keith? Anybody have a mortgage? Like, well, let, let, let's pay for that, right? Is that, what it, is that what it's saying, right? No, this is talking about pity, right? This is someone in, in material possessions really in need, right? And if we're honest, there are some things that are not needs. They're wants, and they're, that's different. Right? But we have to start that type of love and that caring for one another here, and then it should flow outward. He goes on to say, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Right? It's easy to give lip service. Oh, yeah, I love my church. I, I love the people in our church. I, I love people. I love God, so love the world. I love the world, <laughs> right? Do you really? Have you been around the world lately? Have you left this town? Because even in this town, it, it started, there's some unlovable people, it feels like, at times. So let's define these words. He, he, we're going to end this thought here. Dear children, there's that, why we're calling this dear friends and children, because he keeps giving those terms of endearment over and over. John's talking, like, listen, friends, kids, God's kids, let's, let's talk about this. Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So here's what this word means. Actions, to work or accomplish. A deed that carries out or completes an inner desire or an intention and a purpose. I love that because it's not just a, a thoughtless action. Like, okay, all right, I need everybody to move the chairs after service. Most of you would just do it. Like, okay, we'll move the chairs. Right? But then when it, it starts to become an internal thing, like I want to do this, I, I, God's compelling me to, to serve, and, and I'm grateful that many people have stepped up within our church, and you're, you're volunteering and doing certain things, and hopefully it's not because, man, Pastor Joe just nagged me and nagged me and nagged me until I did it, and I finally said, okay, I'll greet. Leave me alone. <laughs> Thanks for laughing, Mike. That was good. Right? So this, is a, this should be something, that an action. So, so John's saying, don't, don't just do it. 
don't let the action just be an action. Let it be because there's an intention and a purpose. And then truth. Not merely truth as spoken, but it's a reality. It's a sincerity. It's actually like I mean it. John realized that love must be sincere. That's why social media doesn't help when someone just gives you the love, the love. Right? It doesn't seem sincere. You like it. It's temporary. But this type of love should be seen in actions and in truth. You shouldn't have action in the church if it's not motivated internally. Right? It should be. It should be connected. And you shouldn't have truth if it's just lip service with no action. Here's a great, a great quote that kind of talks about this. And I've, I've said this quote before, and it came across. I said, oh, this is good. I feel like I've heard this before. It's easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to love individual men and women, especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, or otherwise unattractive. Loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. Think about that, right? It's easy just to say that word, like, oh yeah, I love people, and then realize I'm actually not doing a good job with that. And so I'm going to reread this verse in a different version from top to bottom, from 11 to 18. We're going to ask some questions, and we're going to respond to God's word. That's the best thing to do. It says this, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Right? See that connection? Cain was upset because Abel was doing righteous things. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. And so here's where I want to land this morning. Where are you in this love-hate relationship? Maybe you've, and, I, and again, I felt led to talk about this even during worship. Maybe you've never responded to the love of the Lord. And you're like, yeah, I know he loves me. Sometimes the thing that keeps us back is we can't forgive ourselves. We can't love ourselves. And so we're like, how could God love us when I don't even like me? And so maybe you need to reconcile that with the Lord this morning. And maybe your, your hate has been miscued. Maybe you're loving too many things that you shouldn't love, and you should be hating them, loving them less by putting God first, put him in the right order. Maybe there are some things that are just evil, plain evil in your life, and you're like, no, I need to get that out of my life. Why is that in there? And then I want to think you to think about your own relationship with Jesus, your own life within, hopefully, this church, if this is your church, and where are you loving in actions and in truth? And the goal is, again, this is the training ground as a church. That if we can figure that out here, we should be able to do it out there than with somebody that's not part of our church and inviting them in because we're showing them the love of Jesus with our actions, their intentional actions, and we're speaking the truth, sometimes through our actions. Right? We all like that term, actions speak louder than words, and we're like, good, I don't have to say anything. All right, we'll make sure that those actions are truly reflecting Jesus. But sometimes we also will need to use our words. And so don't be scared about that. Just realize if the love of Jesus is in you, here's what I know. It'll come out. It'll really come out. It, it, he, he's not. He doesn't want to stay in. He, he wants to start to come out, and you'll see that. Because this is the reality, right? When somebody's in a new relationship, what happens? Oh, they're giddy, right? They're, 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 they want to tell everyone. They want to change their status profile on social media. There's pictures. There, there's signs. There's everything. And yet, sometimes when it comes to loving Jesus, we're like, well, I don't really want anyone to know. That's private. Really? Well, let's work at it here. Let's be in love with Jesus so much, right? 
That's why we should get excited when we worship. We should be excited to come and pray. And again, just so you know, when we pray on Wednesday, it was awesome this week. We had a, we had a, a, a testimony, like a, 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 what had happened because someone prayed and they gave a, a praise report. Well, those are exciting things. And it all points to who? Jesus. That's the commonality that brings us together. We are in love with Jesus. And that sounds weird to say. It shouldn't sound weird, right? Because we love a lot of things in our life. Is he the number one thing? Everything should trickle down from there. I've asked Jen and Gabby to come play a song in just a little bit, but I would like you to stand this morning. I want to give you an opportunity to reply and respond to God's word. You've heard it. You've heard what we said. You've heard what God's word says. And now, where are you at? What, 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 where do you need to respond this morning? And so I'm going to pray, and we're going to open up these altars for a little bit. And again, what that means is we want to pray for, pray for you, pray with you. We want to encourage you. And again, sometimes there's real stuff that needs to be left at this altar and picked up, just like when we prayed with, that, with those hands that way, right? And again, there is not something magical that happens because you turn your hands this way, but God will respond to you when you respond to him. He's waiting, and he just wants you to be honest and real with him. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this moment. We pray, Lord God, that each and every person would take inventory. And, and, and try to discover and, and, and know if they have re really responded to your love. Maybe they've never turned from their sins and said, I need Jesus. And I pray right now that they would, each and every person, that if there's someone in this room that has not, has never done that. And we've already discovered over the last few weeks that we can't say that, oh, I've never sinned. That's not me, because each of us have. And I pray, God, that we would reconcile that sin. We would take care of it and say, Lord, I have messed up. I have made mistakes. And I do need to be forgiven. And I can't do it on my own. I've been running from my past. I've been running from my sins and my mistakes. And I can't get around that. And so, Lord, I pray that your love would overwhelm each and every one of us. And we would respond to that love. And for those of us in this room, God, that maybe we need to grow in that love. And we need to grow in, in living that love out in actions and in truth. Will you just begin to speak to our heart and our mind in the way that only you can? And you would give us creative ways to do that. You'd give us opportunities this week where we can see clearly that we are representing you well. We ask for your strength, Holy Spirit, to do that because we can't do that on our own. And I pray that we would grow in that. In Jesus' name.